for the reminder, Carolyn. Um, Jonathan Pellin has graciously agreed to introduce our speaker tonight, so I'll turn it over to him at this point. Thank you, John. All righty. Um, earlier this year, Melanie Wise reintroduced me to Dr. Nathan Morehouse, uh, even though he was already in my bibliography. Um, he has now become front and center because of uh, the various things that he's interested in that coincide with my interests. Thanks, M. Dove. You got to love his uh, CV intro. intro. Um, my research career started as a little boy. I identify with that. And I think a lot of us, um, you know, would too, if not in research sense, in just the sense of our interest in nature. He got his bachelor's at Cornell University, just like Merrill Peterson. And he spent two years after his bachelor's traveling and working, uh, working, working, a salmon fisherman in Alaska, a farmhand in Vancouver Island. And for those reasons alone, I will consider him part of our Northwest component. And then uh, he went uh, to become a high school teacher and as a general manager and sommelier, oh, I knew I was gonna botch that, for a French restaurant. Not bad for an interim between that and your PhD, which he got at Arizona State University under Ron Rutowski. I don't know if I pronounced his name right either, but he's a famous guy for butterfly wings. He did this postdoc at the Université de Tours in France, and uh, he was a Marie Curie fellow. Now, I just imagine that that's a pretty big deal, so that's a pretty big deal. Uh, between 2011 and 2016, he was the assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and currently he is associate professor at the University of Cincinnati. He is a uh, He's responsible for over 38 publications, I'm approximating from his site. And um, I was really impressed when I went to the, the, the first time I went to his uh, homepage where it has stated, we strive to test theory by understanding mechanism. Uh, this is a wonderfully succinct delivery of what science really is. And every one of his publications that I've read resonates with this theme. I am privileged and delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Nathan Morehouse, Colors, Choices, and Conflict, we're in for a treat. <laughs> well, thank you so much for a really gracious uh, introduction, Jonathan. It's such a delight to be here with all of you. Uh, you're the last thing in my day here on the East Coast, so I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. I've packed my presentation with information. I may even have to skip some portions of it just in the interest of time, but I'm happy to hang back and answer any questions you might have and just share our appreciation for butterflies. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now and begin my presentation and uh, look forward to hearing your, your comments uh, in the chat and in person afterwards. Um, can everybody see my screen? Jonathan, can you? Confirm that you see my screen? Yep, it's bright and perfect. Great, and uh, so um, today I'm gonna share with you work that uh, my research group and I have conducted on cabbage white butterflies, perhaps not the most, um, uh, you, it's, you know, ex extravagant of butterflies, but nevertheless, butterflies that live incredibly rich and interesting lives. I run a research group at the University of Cincinnati focused on the visual and behavioral ecology of insects and spiders. And as I was chatting earlier ahead of the talk today, I was just mentioning that, um, you know, my lab's kind of split between jumping spiders and butterflies. And, um, and so I actually, I'm gonna start uh, <laughs> with sharing with you a video of a jumping spider because I just want us all to appreciate the exuberance that is nature attempting to find a mate. Here's one of the jumping spiders that my lab studies. It's called the peacock jumping spider. They live in Australia. This is the male here and he's uh, both singing and dancing for a female that's out of view right now. And my research group really is fascinated by these kinds of interactions. Why is this male so hesitant? What goes into his display? What is going through the female's mind right now? Actually, it's the decision between letting him mate with her and, and, and eating her and eating him, which is why he's so hesitant here. And if we look across the animal kingdom, we find that all sorts of different animals 
have a variety of strategies for this critical moment in their lives, which is convincing a member of the opposite sex that they are the one, they're the one to mate with. And uh, this pressure to be the one that mates has resulted in a type of evolutionary pressure called sexual selection that drives the exaggeration and this kind of creative exuberance in nature which was actually a real challenge for Darwin to understand at first, because many of these traits really fly in the face of his theory of natural selection. They're clearly not great for surviving. You know, these antlers or narwhal tusks or the bright colors that make some of these animals so obvious to their predators. And so he developed a theory called sexual selection to explain these traits. And much of the work that has focused on these puzzling traits has focused on traits that are really important for that early stage for, if you will, animal foreplay. What happens ahead of copulation? We call this pre-copulatory sexual selection. And this is a really important force in shaping the way that animals look and behave, the songs and dances that they, uh, they engage in. Uh, more recently, researchers have begun to understand the incredible diversity that is involved in sexual selection that occurs after mating, what we call post-copulatory sexual selection. Uh, males are oftentimes still competing with each other, even inside the female reproductive tract through um, races between sperm or compounds that they transfer to the female reproductive tract that advantage them and disadvantage rivals. And so really we're beginning to understand that sexual selection is not just shaping the appearance of animals and the traits they use to convince members of the opposite sex to mate with them, but continues after this threshold of copulation. And although the diversity that, that arises from these post-copulatory sexual selection uh, pressures it is perhaps cryptic or not so visible to the eye, it's nevertheless just as wondrous. So here I'm showing you a bunch of pictures of copulatory organs of insects off on the left here. Uh, you have a damselfly with the male's copulatory organ it has these little curved structures in the top. Um, and I'll just put on my little laser pointer. So you, you see these up here. These are actually for scrubbing out the sperm from the last male that the female mated with. Uh, some other males engage in perhaps less condonable activities like using spiked intermittent or sexual organs to damage the female reproductive tract to make her less likely to mate with another male rapidly. Um, other things that have been studied to some extent are uh, how sperm morphologies have evolved. And sometimes you have sperm that actually swim together in long snake-like strings like these cooperatively swimming sperm. Now, it's not just males that are engaged in evolving structures to, to advantage them in copula or after copula. It's also female. So here is a water strider female abdomen. And she has evolved this spike that rises off the back of her abdomen because male water striders are notoriously persistent and, and controlling partners and they will continuously mate and then guard females. And that's not great for females because it prevents them from eating, from laying eggs, from mating with partners of her choice. And so things like this spine here help her to regain a, a, some semblance of control over her reproductive life. Now it's uh, just as an aside, it's, it's, it's on purpose that I've only represented one female adaptation in this slide. And that's because we really know far, far less about the female side of the equation here. That's a, a, a scientific bias, not a biological one. It has to do with our own ideas about who controls reproduction in animals and in humans. And that bias is changing. And I hope the work that I'll present a little bit later is part of that change. Nevertheless, researchers are really beginning to understand that there are two or multiple episodes of sexual selection, this pre-copulatory phase that's been so important to our understanding and this post-copulatory phase. And researchers have become increasingly interested in understanding how these two are connected, if at all. Are they connected with underlying biological links? So in other words, are males that are much sexier at the, in the early stages also winning the race later? Or are some males doing well early 
but losing out to competition after copulation. People are also interested in what kinds of evolutionary drivers might be connecting or, or separating these two contexts. And the reason why this is an important question is that if you think about the evolution of animals like butterflies or red deer, for example, the result of sexual selection is going to be some combination of these two processes. So understanding how they're connected is really essential to understanding the diversity that we see in the world around. So that's the kind of broad framing or the broad importance intellectually of the work that I wanna to present today. But of course, you're all here to hear about butterflies. And so my talk is gonna be split into three parts. I wanna first tell you a bit about what we've discovered about how females choose males and the role that male coloration plays in that. And then I wanna tell you a little bit more about what the value is of male color from the female perspective. And finally, we're gonna go down a bit of a rabbit hole of talking about conflict between the sexes and the kind of strange biology of butterfly reproduction which may actually really change the way that you think about the butterflies that you hold so dear if you don't know some of these details about them. Hopefully for the better, but it is a, a strange world when you get into butterfly reproduction. So let's start here. Much of what we know about female choice, especially with regard to how colorful males are, comes from a couple of key groups. One of them, of course, is birds, and I'm showing you some exemplars here of birds that have played an important role in our understanding of how females choose males based on color, from peacocks and peahens to house finches to barn swallows. Fish have also played a really critical role in understanding this equation. Uh, everything from these African cichlid fish here, um, from, uh, from the African rift lakes to the Trinidadian guppies. And what has been conspicuously absent from this literature on understanding female choices based on color have been insects and spiders. And this is a bit puzzling given the diversity and oftentimes really incredible or flamboyant colors that these animals showcase. They're also really tractable. They're very available in our backyards. And so my lab has really focused on understanding these kinds of questions in insects and spiders with a focus on butterflies and jumping spiders. Now, we're not the only ones to notice that these animals are colorful or that these animals might be making choices about mates based on color. In fact, Darwin, in his second most famous book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, which is the book where he developed this theory of sexual selection, really highlighted butterflies as an example where he felt female preferences for, uh, for male coloration might be driving the evolution of bright colors in male butterflies. Now he anthropomorphized this process a little bit, but what he observed was that um, in many butterfly species, males like these bird wing butterfly males across the top here are much more colorful than their female counterparts. Nathan, and we've driven... lost your screen. Uh-oh. I got it. Is anybody I've else got having? It. I've got it. <clears throat> I've got it. Yeah, I have it too. Um, sometimes can... when people have problems with um, with Zoom, if they just go out of the meeting and come back, it out actually fixes it. I've got the screen. I'm also happy to toggle and share again if that's useful. Shall we just proceed? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll slow my pace a little bit here so, so that whoever is, is struggling uh, doesn't miss out on too much. But what Darwin, what Darwin hypothesized was that these bright male colors were the re result of aesthetic preferences as he described them on the part of females, that females had a sense of beauty and that they preferred more colorful males as mates. But this was a somewhat controversial opinion and one that he argued actually relatively vociferously with a contemporary at the time, Alfred Russell Wallace, who also developed his own theory of evolution roughly at the same time. Although Wallace was uh, a couple decades his junior, kind of a 20 something upstart. But Wallace and Darwin wrote back and forth as Victorian gentlemen were prone to do, 
arguing about butterfly color and why males and females in the butterfly kingdom might differ in color. And what Wallace argued was actually that it was the females that were changing and not the males. He said, no, 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 no. The females are evolving to be more drab to avoid predation under natural selection. And it's just the ancient or ancestral characteristic of this bright coloration. So they went back and forth about whether it was natural selection or sexual selection driving these differences between the sexes. And I, I hope that I can maybe add a little bit of evidence to this ancient or, or, or old debate by um, sharing with you some of the work that we've done on the cabbage white butterfly here, which is obviously one of the most colorful butterflies in the world, which is why we chose it. <laughs> I'm joking, but these animals are actually incredibly colorful and I need to first convince you that they're colorful because to us, they're not, they're black and white. Um, they might be endearing, but they're, but they're not very colorful to us. So what you're looking at right now is a real animal that is half male and half female. This is a type of animal called the bilateral gynandromorph. That's a million dollar word right there. What happened at the first cell division of this animal here was that the sex chromosomes missegregated. And the result was that half of the animal developed as a female and half as a male. These arise in our lab colony once every 20,000 butterflies or something like that. And they end up being a really fantastic um, illustration of the differences between the sexes. So on the right hand side, you can see the female color appearance. And You'll notice that females have this prominent second spot on their dorsal forewings. They're also a little bit more melanic, more melanin in the, in the scales close to their body. So they overall look a bit darker. The white areas of the wing, especially on the male side, are much brighter though. And actually this brightness of the white areas of the wing is distinct enough that trained members of my lab can spot this on the wing, if you will, when we're collecting these animals in the wild. If we look in the ultraviolet though, these are wavelengths that we cannot see, but butterflies can. In these white areas of the wing, this pattern of brightness and darkness flips. Male wings in these white areas of the, of the wing are darker than females uh, in the same areas of the wing. And if we measure these colors using a device that measures light reflectance at different wavelengths, something called a spectrophotometer, we see exactly that. These male cabbage whites reflect more light in the wavelengths that our eyes can see and less light in the wavelengths uh, in the ultraviolet. Now, how do butterflies see these colors here? I've argued that these butterflies are colorful to each other. And in order to understand that question, we really need to delve into the visual world of, of butterflies. This is something that Gary Bernard, who's in the audience today, has done quite a bit of work on, really pushed the field forward. And so we're building on his and the work of others. Uh, and, and one of the things that we've discovered about butterflies is that although their acuity, their ability to see pattern in the world around them is not as good as ours, their color vision is arguably superior. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that they have many more types of color sensitive cells in their eye. So in, in the cabbage white butterfly, they have six different types of photoreceptors or cells in their eye that are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. A UV sensitive cell, a violet sensitive cell, a blue, green, red, and deep red sensitive cell. And just to remind you of your own inadequacies on this front, Everything that you're seeing today in my presentation is provided to you by only three different cell types, a blue, green, and red sensitive cell type. And color is such an important part of our visual world. You can only imagine that if you had twice as many cells to provide you with this wider range of color vision, that color would become even more important. But how do we actually understand how these butterflies see the world beyond just the sensitivities that they have to light? And here, we really can't ask them questions about this. We have to use our understanding of this color vision and use um, some mathematical modeling to estimate how they see color. And, and this begins by setting these butterflies in the ecological context that they live in and measuring important aspects of the light in these environments. 
So to do so, we measure things like the amount of sunlight available during the times of day that they're active. We measure colors like the male coloration I've been telling you about. And then it's important for us to measure the colors of background objects because eyes like yours and I, uh, as well, as, well as, as butterflies, adjust to the backgrounds against which they see colors. Now we add the, these measurements into some complicated math, which I'm not gonna walk you through today, um, but this allows us to estimate two qualities here. The first is brightness differences. We call this luminance contrast, and that's gonna be represented by an L. And the other is color differences, something that we call chromatic contrast, or in the formal scientific literature, it's called Delta S. And so when we look at color differences like this, but we model how the eye of these butterflies sees these color differences, we can estimate differences between these males and females. And, and what we find is that males are more colorful, they have higher chromatic contrast, and they're also brighter. So they have higher luminance contrast than those female wings. And so what that means is that although these butterflies look like this to us, the best way that I can translate this into your visual system is to represent this in this way. These would be kind of a deep violet, but bright uh, violet on males and maybe more of a lavender for females. So this begs a question, why are male cabbage whites, pyrus rapi, more colorful than females? And I'm gonna answer this question on a couple of different levels. The first, level is to ask what are the mechanisms for uh, these differences in color? What is it about their wings that makes these colors different? And really what I'm asking is why are male wings brighter in those wavelengths that we can see while simultaneously darker in these ultraviolet wavelengths? And it turns out, I was talking with Paulette just before the start of the meeting about this, that the answer to this question is really one molecule. It is a type of pigment called leucoterin part of a group of pigments called terrans, and terran comes from the Greek root teros, which means wing, and that's because these pigments were first discovered in butterfly wings. And the key terran pigment in cabbage white wings is this one here, it's called leucoterran. It absorbs very strongly in the ultraviolet. But what these butterflies do is something incredibly clever. They group these pigments together, not as a flat sheet, but in small football shaped granules in the scales on the surface of their wing. And you can see them here. Males put more of these Terran pigments in their wings than females do. And the result is not only more ultraviolet absorbance by the pigments, but these little pigment granules, which are more numerous in the males than in the females, act as really efficient light scatterers for the wavelengths that we, that we can see. And so the result is kind of like powdered chalk that they reflect back a lot of light. By using this combination of light scattering and light absorption from the pigments, males are able to use the same thing, this Terran pigment, to make their wings more colorful than those of females. Okay, so we have a handle on the underlying kind of physics of how they make themselves more colorful, but why in the kind of ultimate or evolutionary sense have males evolved more colorful wing patterns? And in order to understand this, we really needed to begin asking questions about what females thought of these colors in the context of courtship. And what you're looking at here is an illustration of a common courtship behavior in cabbage white butterflies. Males, when they encounter a female, will oftentimes engage in these pendulum-like swings underneath the female, where he's showcasing those colors I've talked to you a bit about now to the female's vision. And uh, his hope is that he can convince the female to follow him down to some plant or to the ground where he's able to mate with her. Now, the first clue for us that females were making choices about who to mate with was that female cabbage whites uh, engage in a very stereotypical mate refusal posture. That's really what we call it. That's the formal name for it, the mate refusal posture. And you may have seen female cabbage whites do this if you spent any time focusing on them in your gardens or in natural areas. 
the female lays down her wings and raises her abdomen. And this is kind of double protection against this poor brokenhearted male over here, because if the male tries to get close to her, to couple with her, with his abdomen, he's prevented from getting close to her by these wings. But even if he decides to clamber onto the wings, she's raised her abdomen. So it's really mechanically impossible for her to pair with her. And, and the important thing to note here is that females, regardless of whether they've mated or not mated before, will reject some proportion of the males that they encounter, the males that court them in this way. Another thing that females do, which you've probably seen before, are what are called ascending flights, where the female corkscrews up into the sky, sometimes two or three stories high, and you'll see one of the butterflies kind of fall off and fly away. That's typically the male when he realizes he's being rejected. So this combination of mate refusal posture and ascending flights means that females are really truly making choices. So we ran a series of experiments, I'll just highlight one today, where we asked females essentially, what are the types of males that you prefer to mate with? And then we measured the colors of the males that were mating with females after this experiment or were rejected by females. And what we found was that those males that were mated, those males that had been successfully accepted by females were more colorful as viewed through the, through the female visual system than those that had not. And they were also brighter. So again, we see that more colorful and brighter males seem to have an advantage here. And so we argue that males have evolved these more colorful wings because females prefer to mate with more colorful males. This just kicks the set of questions down the way because now that we know that females prefer these more colorful males as mates, we need to understand why. What are females getting out of this situation? What is it that male colors tell females? Another way of asking this is what does male coloration advertise about the male's qualities that might be preferable to the female? And here we need to step beyond those initial uh, courtship phases to think about what females get when they mate with males. So here we're crossing this boundary. We're going from this pre-copulatory sexual selection to this post-copulatory sexual selection. Um, to ask what males provide to females. And it turns out that in cabbage whites, males provide quite a bit. It, uh, when cabbage white males mate with females, they transfer up to 13% of their body weight in what's called a spermatophore. It's transferred internally. It's an ejaculatory uh, uh, structure that they transfer into a specialized portion of the female reproductive tract. This is incredibly nutrient rich and females actually rely on this, this gift, oftentimes called the nuptial gift, to fund things like repairing their body tissues and to help them in the production of eggs. We estimate that a single one of these can provide as much protein uh, as is needed to, to produce 70 eggs. And as a matter of fact, because, and I'll mention this a bit later, females mate multiple times in cabbage whites over the course of their life, we estimate that as much as half of the eggs that females produce over the course of their life are made with proteins that are provided to them by their male mates. We also know that this spermatophore influences how quickly females mate again, and this will become important later. So the female really needs to digest this large protein rich uh, secretion from the male before she's willing to mate again. Here is where the male deposits it. It's in a special portion of the female reproductive tract that we'll talk in depth about in a minute. It's called the bursa copulatrix or the mating purse. And it turns out that males don't always gift equally. So these are spermatophores from unmated males from a lab colony. They've been provided with the, the, the silver platter treatment. They've had enough to eat. They um, have all grown up in controlled conditions. And yet some males are producing large spermatophores like this one here, and others are producing these little piddly things here. So we wanted to know whether or not females had any information provided to them from the male colors that might help them to understand whether or not they'd selected a male that would provide them with a lot of resources versus a male that was only gonna provide them with very few. And we set this up in a hypothesis testing framework where we wanted to know whether or not 
one of two scenarios was happening. We labeled these the honest salesman and the planned promiscuity hypotheses. And, and they go a bit like this. So males might be honestly advertising the resources that they can provide to females when they mate, such that males that are of brighter or more colorful coloration on their wings have higher spermatophore quality that might be larger or more protein rich. The other possibility though, equally as plausible theoretically, is that males that are more attractive because they have brighter colors are anticipating mating more frequently as a result of their attractiveness and therefore they scrimp. They essentially plan for this promiscuity or for this multiple mating and they provide females with fewer and uh, uh, fewer resources when they mate with them. So we, um, we looked at this relationship between male color and male spermatophore quality by mating a bunch of male butterflies of different uh, color phenotypes. And uh, these are the results from this. So the first thing to note, the first thing we measured was male body size because it stands to reason that larger males should be in a position to provide larger spermatophores just because they have more resources. And this in fact was true. So we find that the size of the spermatophore measured here by the mass of it, as well as its protein content went up the larger that a male was. But these male size differences here are difficult for females to assess on the wing because the males are fluttering and there's a lot of dynamic interaction between males and females. And so we were really pleased or you know, kind of impressed to find out that just as predictive of this difference in protein content and sizes of spermatophores was how colorful the male's wings were and at least for the, for, from the standpoint of the size of the spermata, so was that brightness difference between males. So males that are more colorful and brighter are producing larger spermatophores. And so we believe that females are using these color differences between males as a shortcut to assess the resources that females might actually get from the male when, when she mates with him. Something that she wouldn't otherwise have access to because of course, once she chooses a male to mate, then she's kind of stuck with him regardless of the size of the spermatophore that she transfers. So how do we link these two contexts together? I mentioned earlier that, that we were interested in uniting these two phases of sexual selection. And so in order to do that, I need to walk you through a series of cartoons about the way we think about how these animals manage their resources. These are really built off of economic theory about resource usage. So let me walk you through this. This is gonna be the kind of backbone for this portion of the talk here. Animals, you and I included, are engaged in kind of an economic set of transfers. There are resources in the environment. For you, it's probably in your fridge. For the cabbage whites in your backyard, it's those uh, cabbages or kale in, in the backyard. And they have to acquire the essential resources for growing their bodies. This is a stage called acquisition. Now the pool of resources that these animals acquire to build their bodies from is something that we as scientists call condition. Uh, it's just an, a, a convention in, in, in the scientific field. And, and then animals need to allocate those resources to different types of investments. Ornamentation, like those colors that I've been talking about. Soma, which is their body that's not reproductive, you know, their muscles and their sensory organs, et cetera. And they also have to invest some of it in reproduction. And so how do animals differ in the way that they acquire or allocate resources? This is an important part of connecting the investments in, uh, in spermatophores, which will fall under reproduction with the investments in wing color, which will, which will fall under ornamentation. So it turns out then in natural populations and humans and all sorts of animals, there's variation in both acquisition and in allocation. Some animals are better at getting resources from the environment and some do a better job of how those are allocated or individuals may differ in how they choose to invest those resources in their bodies. And so it, this is a critical thing. How much do individuals like the butterflies we're talking about today vary in their ability to get resources versus vary in their ability or the strategies for allocating those. I'm gonna add one last piece to this and then we'll kind of think through some scenarios here. And that is that researchers have often observed that ornaments like bright colors or big horns or really you know, kind of elaborate songs 
often are expensive and therefore they rely on drawing resources from this underlying pool. It's something that we call condition dependence. They're dependent on the underlying condition of that animal. Now, the critical thing that I wanna highlight today is that we need to know whether or not when looking across cabbage white males, whether they're, they differ mostly in their ability to get resources from the environment, or do they vary in, their, in the strategies they use to allocate those resources? So let's think about variation in the ability to acquire resources. Some individuals might have a very small pool of resources to allocate, and others might have a much larger pool to, to allocate. Um, and we see this in our society, you know, some folks that really, you know, they're on food stamps and they're having a hard time making ends meet and others that have the McMansion and, you know, the, the Lotus and the, the, the weekend boat and the, the beach house. So here, what we find is that if individuals largely differ in their ability to acquire resources from the environment, then some individuals only have a small amount to invest and others have a lot to invest in everything. And the result is that when we look across individuals, we find that different parts of their phenotype, for example, their wing color, is positively related to other things like the size of their bodies or the amount that they can invest in reproduction. This will become more clear when I contrast this with in instances where variation is mostly in how individuals choose to invest those resources. So if everybody gets about the same amount of resources, because they're all about the same at acquiring them, but some individuals put a lot of effort into investing in, for example, their color, others might put a lot of resources into, for example, their spermatophores, at the same time shortchanging their color. Then we find that if we look at relationships between these different ways that they can invest, that there are negative relationships between them. The individuals that are really good at being brightly colored are not so good at investing in, in reproduction. And those that scrimp and save on the color are much better at providing reproductive resources. I'm gonna tether all of this to a real situation, which is these cabbage whites here. And let me tell you a little bit more about the economics of cabbage whites, if you will. So it turns out that the really critical limiting resource for cabbage whites is nitrogen. These animals feed on wide and wild and cultivated crucifers like cabbage, like kale, like small little mustards that you might see that are endemic to your region. And these plants are very, um, uh, uh, they're very limited in the amount of protein that they have in them because plants build their bodies with carbohydrates rather than proteins, whereas these cabbage whites need to build their bodies with proteins. So it turns out that the amount of nitrogen or protein that's available to them as caterpillars really dictates a lot of the dynamics for them growing, growing up and becoming adults. If you restrict the amount of protein they have access to during, as, a, as caterpillars, it slows their growth and stunts their adult body size. They're also really essentially carbohydrate feeders as adults. So they have really no source of nitrogen as adults because they're feeding on nectar. And yet males have this large expense as adults. They have to transfer these very nitrogen or protein rich spermatophores during copulation. This is a source of nitrogen for females. And people have argued that female cabbage whites may be actually using mating as a foraging strategy to get more of this very limiting resource. Now, why am I suddenly talking about nitrogen? Well, it turns out that nitrogen is really the key to unlocking this relationship between colors and uh, the resources that females get when they mate with males. And the reason for that is that that terran pigment that I mentioned earlier, leucoterran, is one of the most nitrogen rich pigments described in the animal kingdom. And that's a bit of a head scratcher because here you have an animal whose whole lifestyle is limited by its access to this limiting nutrient and yet it's putting large amounts of that nutrient into the colors in its wings. It can be as much as 14% of, of the adult nitrogen available to one of those males. It goes irreversibly into the wings, never to be recovered. Now, females, by being less colorful, by putting fewer of those pigments in their wings, reduce that investment relatively cleverly 
uh, to about half of that. Where does that nitrogen go? Well, it turns out that they reallocate that nitrogen from their wings to their abdomens for producing those eggs, which are so essential to their fitness. So let's go back to this complicated diagram that I shared with you earlier. How would we crack this? How would we measure these relationships that evolutionary theory tells us may or may not exist here? And it turns out that using something like a simple currency, like an economist, really helps here. Because we know nitrogen is really limiting for these animals, and yet it plays an important role, not just in their wing colors, but also in those spermatophores that I talked about earlier, we can track its flow from the environment through the acquisition as caterpillars and then look at where they invest this into their adult bodies. And this is exactly what we did. So we took a bunch of cabbage whites. This was a crazy experiment. I ran this alone and there were so many caterpillars eating in a climate chamber that you could hear them munching. <laughs> Maybe the sound of nightmares for some. For me, just the sound of fatigue and scientific breakthroughs. So we then uh, reared these animals on different diets that differed in the amount of protein that was available to them in the diet. And we reared them to adult butterflies. And then we measured them. We measured them for their body size, for their coloration, for the amount of nitrogen they've been able to acquire, which happens during that caterpillar phase, and where they put that nitrogen in their adult bodies. And importantly, we could look at variation between individuals, not just variation induced by the nitrogen that we provided to them, but variation in their genetics to try to understand how different individuals were. So let's begin with this first property. If those colors are really expensive and therefore rely on this underlying pool of nitrogen here, then they should exhibit this property called condition dependence where individuals that were more colorful would also have more nitrogen in their bodies. And that's indeed what we find, but only for males. So more colorful males off on the right here, as measured by the way that they're perceived by females, have more nitrogen in their bodies. So they are not only acquiring more nitrogen, they're investing it in their wing colors. Females, we don't see. You can maybe make out a little bit of a positive slope here, but it's not a significant relationship. And that's because females are largely reallocating that nitrogen to other ends. What about this difference in acquisition versus allocation? We really need to know this to understand what the relationships might be between color and things like investing and in reproduction. And so again, we looked at this, here are these diets, low nitrogen, medium nitrogen, high nitrogen, and then we reared some on kale. And what we find is that the more nitrogen they have available as caterpillars, the more nitrogen they have in their adult bodies. And this is true for both males and females. We see a lot of heritability here too. That means that the parents and the offspring resemble each other here. So each of these little gray lines is different families siblings resemble each other. And that means that some genetic backgrounds, some, some genotypes of these animals are better or worse at getting protein out of these different diets. But what about how they allocate these resources? Well, it turns out that there's really no variation between these uh, different diet treatments and where they put these resources. So they largely stick by kind of a set script in terms of the amount that they put into their wings or their abdomen or their um, head and thorax. This is very stable and there's really no genetic variation, particularly in males. So in other words, they really kind of are set in how much of these resources they invest. So now we're in a situation here where most of the variation between males is in how well they've done at getting this limiting resource from the environment into the pool of resources that they have to invest. And then once they have those resources as caterpillars, how they invest those as adults is pretty fixed. It's pretty set. The result is that we should expect that some animals will get a lot of resources and have a lot to go around and others will have less resources and very little to go around. And this should drive positive relationships between these different traits. And it turns out that this is exactly what we find. 
So this may look very similar to the other graph that I showed you, but here we're looking at the amount that they invest in their abdomen. And it turns out that more colorful males have more nitrogen in their abdomens. And this is the source of proteins for those spermatophores that I mentioned earlier. And so here, this relationship that I showed earlier, which we think is so critical to females' choices about who to mate with, is actually driven by the architecture of how they deal with the economics of their resources. So to kind of sum this up, females benefit from choosing more colorful males because they get more resources in the form of these spermatophores. Now, males are, are advertising their ability to provide to these females because their colors are linked to the size and protein content of their spermatophores because they rely on this underlying limiting resource, which is nitrogen. And I just give a quick aside here. Although we can still see these relationships, a colleague and I have studied this historically. And it turns out that these relationships were even stronger before World War II. And the reason for that was that during the World War II war effort, there was an, a building of an enormous number of plants to make nitrogen-based explosives for the war effort. And after World War II ended, those uh, nitrile plants were repurposed to become nitrogen fertilizer producing plants. And this is a huge boom to the agricultural economy of the United States. We had figured out how to make nitrogenous fertilizers to, to feed our crops. But the result was that we were dumping huge amounts of nitrogen into our natural environments and our agricultural environments. And the consequence was that cabbage whites suddenly got this windfall of nitrogen. And that suddenly loosened these relationships between or these constraints of access to nitrogen. Happy to follow up more. It's a fascinating history of how we are beginning to muck a little bit with these ancient ways of sorting out who is or isn't a good individual to mate with. So just to conclude this part of the talk, we're now really kind of developing links between colors that are involved in choices before copulation and the benefits that females might be pursuing or receiving after they've already selected a mate. And we think that nutrition really is a useful link and what we call life history architecture, this economic um, perspective on how animals deal with, with the resources that they use to build themselves and to pursue their li lifestyles. These are really critical things to pay attention to, to make this big connection. All right, the last thing that I wanna get into quickly with all of you today is um, to- can, can yeah. we break for a couple questions? Oh yeah, absolutely. I forgot that you folks break uh, in, in the middle. So I apologize to have blown straight through, but yeah, absolutely happy to answer questions at this, at this time. Okay, first question is about the nitrogen limitation. Um, is, is that um, specific to cabbage whites or, or um, to Lepidoptera in general? And, and does that influence feeding strategies. I mean, if it's the terrain that's, um, that's um, nitrogen rich, I, I, I don't know how that affects other butterflies. It's a great question. So there's a lot of diversity across the, the butterfly um, phylogeny in how they relate to plants and, and the amount of nitrogen in their food plants. Pyarid butterflies, or I should say the pyarine in particular, are particularly nitrogen limited because of their affiliation with these nitrogen poor plants. Um, the coleogeny, uh, uh, in contrast, often feed on nitrogen fixing plants in the, in the, in the legume uh, family. And, and those are much richer in, in nitrogen for the caterpillars. And the result from the color standpoint is that many coleogeny have actually shifted to using other kinds of colors like ultraviolet structural colors. So coleus erythemi, who you might be familiar with, has these brilliant ultraviolet um, patterns on their wings. They still have those Terran pigments, but they're no longer really a source of useful information to females because the males and the females are not under this persistent nitrogen limitation. So we actually, in looking across all butterflies, we are beginning to see signatures of 
the plant and the limitations that the plant imposes on the palette of colors that they use during mate choice where their females are really focused in on colors that give them some kind of useful information about male quality. Okay, thank you. Another question is um, back, going back um, pretty much to the beginning of your talk, um, you showed different male genitalia and uh, you, you referenced the female um, damselfly. What are the species of of the insects um, that you, of the genitalia that you show, male genitalia? That, that's that's a great question. So actually those kind of um, toothbrush-like uh, genitalia are very common across damselflies. Um, you know, the damselflies that you would be familiar with in the Seattle area are going to have those. Um, I'm trying to think of, of species that are common in your area. Um, uh, we have Coleopteryx damselflies here that, that have those types of genitalia. Um, the, uh, the beetle ones that are spiny are from a, a genus called Calusobrucus, which are kind of seed weevil beetles. And those have been extensively studied on, on, on this side of things. And then the other genitalia that I showed are actually um, honeybee genitalia. And bumblebee genitalia look very similarly to that as well. They have these kind of elaborate frond-like aspects to their, to their genitalia that um, in, in some instances, I'm not the expert on, on, on honeybees or bumblebee genitalia, so I, I'm not sure, I haven't read the literature deeply enough to know exactly what those things are doing, but uh, they're certainly performing some kind of reproductive uh, action for those animals as well. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question, Bob? Yes, thank you. Another question is, um, um, is the male courting behavior part of his strategy to show his color to advantage? Yes, absolutely. Because it turns out that um, the relationships that I've talked about with regard to male color and for example, the size of his spermatophore don't hold true for the colors on the undersurfaces of his wings, something that's a bit puzzling to us that we're, that we're following up on. And so if the male were to um, court females in a way that showcased those ventral surfaces to his wings, he would be really missing out on the opportunity to share this information with her. What's interesting though, is that female ventral coloration. So females are oftentimes a little bit more kind of margarine yellow on the undersurface of their wings. And those turn out to be predictive of female uh, egg number and fecundity. And uh, males um, are actually attentive to those, uh, those sides of the female wings, oftentimes evaluating that when females are at rest or when the male alights next to the female to mate with her. Uh, male choice is a little bit more permissive in that way um, than females are. Uh, a trend across the animal kingdom, if you will. But nevertheless, there seems to be this kind of separation of where the signals are, if you will. And so the male is really trying to make sure that the female can see those dorsal surfaces of his wings, which seem to have been elaborated to communicate this information. It's interesting, the relationship between behavior and, and you know, the biology of the color. Um, another question is, um, if uh, can can the female eject um, the spermatophore, or does she have a choice once once the spermatophore has been inserted in in um, whether she accepts that or rejects that? Does she have any? No. Okay. No. So in contrast to a number of other animal groups where females can dump the male contribution or reject it outright, in this instance, of course, the female can break off copulation. But whatever is already inside her is not something that she can that she can really get rid of. And as I'll describe in the last part of my talk, it turns out that the male really kind of secretes something that hardens fairly quickly in her reproductive tract. So it would be difficult for her to get rid of it. She really just has to to digest it, as as I'll describe. But no, females are really need to avail themselves of these earlier stages where they can reject males. And once they've paired with the male, his claspers do a pretty good job of holding her. Uh, and so she really needs to struggle to get out of the circumstance. But, but males are not able to force copulate with females and butterflies. Um, the female really does need to at least acquiesce at those first stages for the male to couple with her. But beyond that point, she's kind of 
there's not any clear indication that she can really do anything to reject the mail at that stage. Okay, thank you. Um, part three then. All right, thanks for sticking with me. Um, so the last, the last part here is to talk about sexual conflict because all is not flowers and colors in the realm of butterflies. I hinted at this earlier. Um, and sexual conflict is where the interests of males and females diverge. So what is good for a male is not always good for a female and vice versa. And the really the locus of conflict or one of the loci of conflict for butterflies and in particular the cabbage whites is over this spermatophore. As we, you know, it was a perfect segue for that last question. So females do mate multiply, it's something we call polyandry. Uh, in cabbage whites, females mate on average two to three times over the course of their life. Although I think the record, the world record is 10 times. Um, so females can mate quite a few times in cabbage whites. And um, one of the things that we know is that and when a female mates with a second male, that second male sperm are kind of last in and largely first out to fertilize her eggs. This is something we call last male sperm precedence. In other words, the first male really loses a huge proportion of his paternity share, his ability to fertilize her eggs after she mates with another male. This creates strong incentive for males to try to prevent females from mating again after they've mated with him. And so the spermatophore in particular offers males a way of preventing females from remating because female remating is really contingent on her breaking down that spermatophore, opening up the space for that male's, uh, for that second or third male spermatophore to be transferred. So this the, the way that this spermatophore is handled inside the female reproductive tract is a, a bit of a battle between the sexes. Males would be advantaged by slowing the process of female digestion of that spermatophore. And females, of course, would benefit from increasing the rate at which she digests it. Not only does she get those resources into her resource pool to repair her body tissues or to produce more eggs more quickly, but also it offers her the chance of mating with another male more rapidly. So let's first talk about the male side. Are there specific things that males do to slow down spermatophore digestion? And I wouldn't be talking to you about this if the answer wasn't yes, but the answer is really kind of wonderfully yes. Um, when we look more carefully at the spermatophore, what we find is that it's not just a big blob of goo like many researchers have treated it by thinking about it as one structure, but rather a wondrously complex structure that the male transfers to the female. It has a very distinct outside, what we call a spermatophore envelope, um, which is tough, very difficult to break down for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Uh, it's actually so difficult to break down that females never fully break down these envelopes. And one of the ways that we know how many times females remate is that when we catch a female from the wild, we can open up her reproductive tract and count the number of these envelopes from past mates in her reproductive tract. The inside, in contrast, is what we like to call nougat in kind of consistency. It's, it's soft, um, it's milky white, and if we look at this from a biochemical standpoint, we find that the outside and the inside of the spermatophore are in very distinct in terms of their biochemical composition. And so we spent some time working with Nathan Clark and his lab group, a group and a biomedical school that really focuses on reproductive proteins and has a lot of advanced tools for studying this to try to understand what are these compounds that are in the male spermatophore? How are they transferred into this structure that looks a bit like a kind of a sad birthday balloon? And, and, and what are the consequences for the male and the female? So I don't need to really go into the details here, although of course we can get deeper into the details if you like, um, but we looked using uh, mass spectrometry and something called proteomics at the composition of different compounds 
in that inner matrix, as we call it, and the outer envelope. And then we also looked at the male reproductive tract and we looked at the kind of the glands, the accessory glands that are the farthest away from the male reproductive opening, the closer portion of them, something called the duplex, which is where those, uh, the, 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 um, the uh, portion of the, the kind of male reproductive tract where the ducts come in, but they're still paired. And then a portion of the male reproductive tract called the simplex where they unite and become a single tube. And that is where all of these compounds will exit and enter the female bursa copulatrix here. And what we found was that when we look at males, they really have this kind of loaded sequentially. I like to think of this being like one of those pastry tubes that you use for decorating cakes, except for that you've got a different color and different flavor at the very tip of the pastry tube than up in the chamber. So it turns out that males produce the compounds that will make the envelope at, and, and then secrete them and add them up right at the entrance to their reproductive tract or the exit, if you will. And that those that contribute to the inner matrix are concentrated in these upper portions of the male reproductive tract. And so this has led us to understand a model of how males make these spermatophores where they sequentially produce these different kinds of proteins and compounds. First, they produce those that will be in the envelope and then they store them down here in this simplex here. They subsequently follow up by making all of the proteins and compounds that will be part of the inner matrix. And all of this happens before the male mates with the female. He's not doing this on the fly. This is not made to order for females. This is prepared ahead of time and then left kind of under the warming lights. And then when the male mates with the female, he transfers these sequentially. So what happens is that that envelope gets transferred first and then it gets inflated by the compounds from the inner matrix, almost like blowing up a balloon. Now, one of the challenges that we face to understanding these compounds here that are part of that outside envelope is the same problem that females face. They're not digestible. And so a lot of the things that we were using biochemically to understand these compounds were not working because we had to find a way of dissolving these compounds into solution to study them. And we just couldn't do that for many of the envelope proteins. So we followed up with a study where we just... Um, acid digested them. That breaks the, all of these proteins down to their amino acids. Uh, so we lose the structure of the proteins themselves. And uh, this was actually a fortuitous break in trying to understand exactly what these compounds were that make this envelope so indigestible because the envelope was incredibly enriched in an amino acid called proline. And this ended up being a kind of telltale thing that we could then use to look across all of the proteins that were in the male reproductive tract and identify those that were high in proline. And it turns out that there are two undescribed seminal fluid proteins, um, reproductive proteins that male butterflies, not just cabbage whites, but butterflies across the butterfly phylogeny, including monarchs, for example, produce what we call these proline rich seminal proteins one and two. And these are really unusual compounds. They're actually most similar in the living world to proteins that are involved in a cell wall structure in plants. So those are a group of proteins called extensins. They're flexible rod-like hydro, uh, hydrophilic or hydrophobic glycoproteins that cross-link to make cell walls in plants. And here we're finding something very similar in butterfly spermatophores. And the, the thinking is that, that these are cross-linking and making this really indigestible matrix and that they've evolved in this kind of tug of war between males and females over how quickly these uh, spermatophores get broken down. Well, what about the female side? I mentioned much earlier that females are really understudied from this perspective. And so I just wanna share with you quickly some of the adaptations that females use to increase their digestion rate. Some of you, if you've spent some time thinking about butterfly genitalia, <laughs> which may be more of you in this audience than the general public, I would guess, will know about something called the signum or a signa. 
And these are characteristic femalogenic tail characters. They vary tremendously across butterflies and moths. Um, they're oftentimes used okay. as species specific characteristics. And these are used to address the indigestibility of the male spermatophore. So in the cabbage white butterfly, they have a hinged chewing jaw-like signum. This is one right here. The hinge runs down the middle. So these are all um, tanned or hardened areas here. And this is a little bit less hardened. And this chewing jaw, um, literally a vagina dentata, if you will, is animated by the female uh, cabbage white butterflies by muscle bundles that attach to the signum here and run down the side of her bursa copulatrix here. And I just wanna give you, this is something that you can't unsee, um, but this is a video of a bursa copulatrix from a cabbage white butterfly chewing on its spermatophore in a Petri dish. And so you can see that those muscles actually flex the walls of that bursa copulatrix. And in doing so, they allow this hinge to kind of flex and those teeth to bore a hole through the side of this indigestible outer envelope. Now to complement this mechanical digestion, uh, these butterflies produce proteolytic enzymes. These are protein digesting enzymes. And we measured these things in newly enclosed one day old virgin and three day old virgin cabbage whites. And to put the amount of protein digesting activity in perspective, we measured the adult leg, which was reassuringly not very digesting, <laughs> and the larval intestine, which would be the quintessential protein digesting organ in the life cycle of these butterflies. And what we find is that the amount of protein digestion that, these, that this bursa copulatrix is capable of is off the charts. I wanna point out that the, this organ, small organ in the female reproductive tract is about 1 20th the size of the larval intestine. And yet it's still in some instances twice or three times the protein, the, the kind of proteolytic activity of the entirety of that caterpillar intestine. So females are pumping in protein digesting enzymes. They're chewing on this and at the same time, they're, they're pumping in um, extraordinary levels of, of, of protein digesting enzymes. Um, so this is the kind of picture that we're seeing here is that males make this impenetrable really or difficult to penetrate outer envelope. Females are secreting these enzymes to break that down while at the same time chewing on it. And you might wonder, well, what evidence do we have that these digesting enzymes are actually digesting these proteins? And we've done this work by co-incubating the bursa enzymes with the spermatophore proteins. And we find robust fall off of, the, um, of these proteins. They just get digested very rapidly. Within a few hours, they can digest many of these proteins very quickly. And so um, it, it really fascinating how females have evolved to uh, combat these tactic, tactics on the male side of things to, re, to delay how, long, or how quickly she can do this. A couple of more things, if we have the time that I just wanna share with you, kind of interesting stories. Where do these proteins or these genes come from rather? Where are the protein digesting enzymes and the, um, and the musculature, et cetera, coming from. This is a sea of data that you don't really need to pay attention to the details of. What we did was we sequenced the tissues, the RNA expression of genes in different tissues, not only in caterpillars here and in adults, but in females at different time stages to ask, are these genes that are used elsewhere in the body? How related are they to other things in the body? And so I just wanna highlight here, this pink box here, these are all genes related to that mechanical digestion on the part of the female bursa copulatrix. And what she's essentially doing 
is borrowing these genes from those that are used for flight muscle. She's taking the same genes that produce things like troponin, which is a key flight muscle gene. She's using the same exact gene to build the muscles that allow her to digest the male spermatophore. In contrast, this little orange box up here are genes that are really restricted to usage in the um, female reproductive tract. And those seem to be evolving very rapidly. Uh, here's a, 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 a phylogeny of the gene family for a class of protease inhibitors that males use to reduce how quickly females can digest their proteins. And it turns out that we repeatedly see all of these copies, each of these ones in red here are new copies of these protease inhibitors, some of which are very specific to this tug of war in the bursa itself. And so here we're seeing not only what we would call evolutionary conservation, where they just repurpose an ancient gene for muscle tissue production. And in other instances, they're rapidly evolving new genes through a process that's oftentimes duplication of genes in their genome, and that releases them to be used specifically in the reproductive tract. Uh, and so this is a really a kind of a dynamic tug of war going on that we're really interested in. Um, and so I'll just kind of conclude here by saying that this bursa, this organ in the female is a dynamic ectopic digestive system the male spermatophore is evolving to impede how quickly females can digest this. That buys the male more time to fertilize the eggs that she's producing. And th these proteins are evolving rapidly. I can double back to this for those that know a bit more about this and show you some of the data that we have for how quickly those genes are evolving because it really is an arms race the female's proteolytic enzymes do a better job of digesting the male proteins. The male evolves proteins that are harder to digest. The female then has to evolve enzymes that are better at digesting these new proteins. And this seems to be under this, this sexual conflict model uh, that, that, um, that arises over this tug of war over how quickly the female mates again. So that was a lot of information, but you know, the, the, the what I hope to leave you with is that not only are we connecting this classic pre-copulatory kind of courtship side of things in cabbage whites, but we're connecting it to fascinating and intriguing tugs of war and physiological processes, et cetera, that are happening inside the female, even after the male is long gone, but yet represent the kind of influence of the male and the female over the shared outcome of producing more cabbage whites. And so um, I just, I, I really, at this point, I wanna first thank these butterflies. Uh, they were a childhood companion growing up in Rochester, New York, and uh, a wonderful place to spend my PhD and subsequent years as a faculty member, really just discovering the magic of their lives. This is a lesson that I think we can all uh, appreciate, which is that the closer you look at nature, the more it reveals itself to you and the more wondrous and mysterious and fascinating it becomes. Uh, the other folks that I have to thank and mention are my collaborators, which um, really challenge my assumptions and, and enrich my life. Um, I've just been really fortunate to, to interact with some extraordinary folks in the course of this work. Um, we've been fortunate with funding uh, support from a number of funding foundations. And of course, if, if you're interested in getting in touch, these are some ways of doing it up in the upper left. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave this up for a moment here. I've got a lab website. Um, you we're on Twitter. You can always email me. Happy to interact with you about your questions, but also happy to stick around and, and, um, and discuss any of this uh, with all of you. Um, I know it's, a, it's also getting late on, on your side, but I'm happy to stick around and, and talk more. So thanks again for the opportunity to share with you. Great, thank you, Nathan. Uh, one of the questions is about the video that you showed. And uh, I know you're very familiar with this, but I think for some of us, it was a little hard to understand exactly what that was, whether that was 
the exterior that um, and it was just a compression or whether you could actually see the teeth chewing into. I was wondering if we if you might be able to replay that and maybe talk us through that uh, a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Let me let me load it here first and then um, and then I'll share my screen. Okay. So we are, this is the bursa copulatrix as an organ with a spermatophore on the inside, um, uh, dissected out of the female on a, on a, on a, a Petri dish. So, so this is really what we're looking at here. And I'll point out, this is the signum here. And the signum is going to be off to the right here. So this is the signum here. And this is the entirety here, this kind of kidney shaped thing here is the bursa. So let me just back up again here. Um, this, this pouch here really is that entire yellow area. Now, some of the much brighter canary yellow areas, that's just fat bodies from the sidewall. And then the, the signum is gonna be that kind of dark chestnut brown here. So you don't actually get to see the signum chewing in this, but you get to see the amount of muscular activity and movement that, that, that this organ is capable of. So if you can imagine this being inside the abdomen of a female butterfly when she receives this, um, you think your tummy grumbling is impressive, but here this is, you know, this is like infant kicking in the womb kind of movements inside the female butterfly, if you will. So, so you removed this, but it, but it was still active. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So the female is, is doing this until she digests that spermatophore entirely. Some of this is under, some of this is under stretch, uh, stretch um, response, but, but they, she also has stretch receptors. Let me just back up to this uh, slide here. So this nerve here is actually a, a stretch receptor that tells her essentially when her bursa is full. And this innervates um, uh, the corpora allata, which is part of the kind of uh, the, uh, the central nervous system that regulates hormone releases. And so she actually becomes hormonally uninterested or hormonally unreceptive to males. You can actually inflate this here just to, just to impact the stretch receptor firing and she'll start refusing males. But you can also you know, clip, sever this nerve here, this bursal nerve here. And even if this is full of a spermatophore, she will then oftentimes readily accept males uh, that are preferred males. So this is her kind of feedback system to doing this here. But the muscles themselves are, are under kind of stretch control or, or so she's not kind of actively, um, you, you know, her motor control system is not telling them to flex. They'll, they will flex and flex until, until, they're, um, until the, the spermatophore is small enough that they don't induce those kinds of, um, those kinds of muscular responses. And what are the sperm doing um, during this digestive process? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. So they get the, the heck out of Dodge. Um, so it turns out that the sperm, uh, this is just a diagram that's useful for explaining this, the sperm are deposited last. So as I mentioned, the envelope goes in first, then that inner matrix gets secreted and that inflates this, this bulb or balloon shaped structure. And behind all of that come the sperm. And those sperm almost immediately, within the first half hour to 45 minutes, swim through this vast deference here and then across and, and, and up into the spermatheca, which is this area here. Um, and, and then as the, as the female um, moves eggs down through here, the sperm will exit one at a time to, to fertilize the eggs. You know, the, it's interesting. Another place where these, these dynamics have been studied to some degree is in Bombyx mori, the silk moth. But Bombyx is, um, has been under sericulture, under human domestication for, for thousands of years. And the way that sericulture has worked, at least for the past thousand years, is to enforce monogamy. So, so males and females are paired, they mate, 
they're separated and then the female goes and lays eggs. And in sericulture, she's not often or, or typically allowed to mate with multiple males. The result has been this diffusing of sexual conflict. So when you look at the spermatophores of silk moths, there's a number of notable differences. One is that the male actually provides a lot more resources and this envelope on the outside is much, much thinner. It's really only there to just keep stuff from, uh, keep stuff intact. Um, so the female Cygna is greatly reduced. And the other thing is that the sperm are kind of mixed in here and they migrate over in a leisurely fashion over the course of four or five days and up to a week. And one of the differences is that they're not, the females are not pumping out proteolytic enzymes in that situation. So in the cabbage white, the sperm leave immediately because they're at high risk of being digested and therefore not contributing to fertilization. Whereas in a situation where that conflict has been diffused in this instance by human hands over, over millennia, um, we see that the that male and female dynamics are much more cooperative and that the sperm are perfectly happy to sit in the bursa for much longer periods of time because they're not at risk of being digested. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, uh, formal presentation is over. Everybody's uh, free to pile on. I guess I have a question about, um, you talked about the um, silk uh, moths. So did they, did they um, change over time to, to uh, have less competition? Um, is, is that what actually happened? I mean, what, I, I'm trying to figure out what kind of their baseline was. Well, that's a great question. The baseline to look at would be the wild relative of the domesticated silk moth. And there's some debate about that, but we think we have it identified now. And it's just waiting for me or somebody else to go look. <laughs> uh, it really is, you know, it's like a pet project. Maybe I'll do it on sabbatical or something like that. would love to study that. But just to compare the domestic silk moth versus its wild relative to ask, how different are those two things? It would involve field work, of course, because you'd have to establish the mating rates of the wild relative. And then, you know, of course, look at, at sericulture practices and try to make sure that you're, you're studying, you know, a sericulture that is, um, that has been enforcing this monogamy for a long time, because there are differences in the way that different um, silk producers do this. But, but to be able to do that would be fascinating. And we've got the tools to do it now, just Nobody's done it yet. If you want to do it, go ahead. <laughs> I would just love to know the answer. And I'm the rate limiting step these days. <laughs> well, if we're free to pile on, as you say, I guess Pyle will pile on for just a moment. A couple of things I want to say, Nathan. Uh, first yes. of all, that was absolutely phenomenal and fascinating. I learned a great deal. I just wish some of the uh, pioneers like Charles Remington, uh, Harry Clanch, other people worked on these systems earlier in their way without the tools you have. I wish they could hear the work that's being done now. It's absolutely magnificent. Oh, I wish I could talk with them because you know I've, I have looked at some of the specimens collected by some of these guys, you know, when I talked about that pre-World War II, post-World War II stuff, yeah. the, the early specimens are these guys. And uh, yeah, it would be, wow, you know, when people ask this question, who would you who would you want to like have a beer with? You know, Remington comes to mind, but uh, yeah, yeah. And oh, Charlie fine. Darwin, if if Darwin could only see what you're doing now. Uh, but I want to say also, uh, I want to thank uh, Waba because I really appreciate you bringing presentations of this quality to the meetings. That helps to make up for not getting to the Lepidoptera Society meetings when they're not held and things like that. It's really wonderful. And then thirdly, and lastly, uh, I want you to know, Nathan, that I also, I dedicated my uh, PhD thesis, which I did with Remington, mm -hmm. not only to my grandmother and great aunt, but also to Pierre Estrapi for being <laughs> the only butterfly I could see out in the wild from my laboratory window. <laughs> the only and oftentimes one of the first in the season too, right? I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's the only thing that told me that butterflies were really out there. <laughs> well, one of the things I love about Pieris as a genus name is that it comes from the Pierian Spring, which is the font of all knowledge. And for me, it feels like 
the the humble cabbage white has performed admirably on that front. So. Yeah, no kidding. And also everything you're studying about the uh, balanced stresses between this, the genders and so on, it all obviously works because this is, uh, I'd say arguably the most successful butterfly in the world. I remember being in a habitat in uh, near Shanghai in 2012. That day we went to the water villages south of Shanghai and there were, there were not many forms of life except human around Shanghai much, but it, around that whole area, there were tens of thousands of butterflies, tens of thousands everywhere we went. Uh, and except for three or four painted ladies, every other one was Pierre Srappi. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So they do well and they, whatever they're doing that you're illuminating for us, it works. Well, and I didn't even have a chance to get into this, but you're giving me the window of opportunity to do so. So we have studied the Japanese subspecies, which is the product of an ancient invasion. So the cabbage whites that we have here in the States were multiple introductions on both coasts. It's one of the best documented early invasive species. You know, Scudder studied this in the late 1800s by writing by hand to all of these amateur lepidopterists. They rode, tr you know, train lines into the U.S. interior right around the C Civil War and just prior to that. But much before that, um, we are beginning to develop a case that cabbage whites actually invaded going eastward across Eurasia and were probably um, traded accidentally with the domestication of brassica crops from the Mediterranean Rim, right? And it created this bridge to um, palatable host plants that were native to Eastern Asia, but it was probably Silk Road transport. And you can track this stuff et etymologically, not entomologically, but etymologically, as you see the words for cabbage or for rapa show up in the languages and when they're first recorded in these more Eastern Asian um, uh, cultures. So, so we think that it was probably one of the original kind of uh, introduced pest species that moved across with the connection of West and East. And it's had all sorts of effects on their biology and physiology. And one of the things that it's done is the, the Japanese subspecies is fighting its war between males and females at that molecular level in the bursa on different fronts. So if you mate the Japanese subspecies with the European subspecies, it takes females two days longer to digest the spermatophore from the other subspecies because they're totally ill-equipped to break it down. So um, anyway, fascinating stuff to be yeah, excuse me while my head explodes. <laughs> it's like incipient speciation. We're watching this butterfly as it invades and then becomes new species. And all of these dynamics are just happening in their own contingencies wherever they are in the world. Fascinating. So Carolyn, did you see cabbage whites in Maui? Um, I did not see cabbage whites in Maui. I only saw monarchs. I swear I saw a white butterfly cross the road, the Kihai Road, into the um, bushes where I saw the monarchs. But the day that I actually hung out there, it rained all day. So. Oh. So I not good knows? for butterflies. I was hoping it was a white monarch, but who knows? They look more like a more like a dream sickle than really white. Hello, it's only me. I just want to say that was amazing. And Nathan, you're a bad man. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So, uh, I, I hope you mean that in the right way. <laughs> that's the uh, four A's, four A's, that's good. Uh, cool. um, you're, it sounds like you're interested in this sexual competition. Would you, can you talk about what your, like, what your next steps are, what you're working on, what you're thinking about? Yeah, well, so one of the things that we're trying to do, I have this penchant for um, 
overly ambitious projects. And that usually takes the form of wanting to understand these kinds of things across lots of species. And um, so one of the things we're doing, some of you may know the name Christopher Vickland, um, who's at the University of Stockholm. And uh, he spent his life studying these pyarid butterflies in Northern Europe. And um, his work has really helped us to understand mating frequencies in different pyarid butterflies. And that really helps us to understand um, which butterflies have a lot of competition between males, for example, where they're at high risk of the female remaining again, and which uh, butterfly species that, that pressure has been released a little bit. So there are some butterflies like Leptidia species that will only mate once. And part of that is that their, their flight season is very restricted in Northern Europe. Um, and so we're, we're interested in whether or not butterflies that mate many times over the course of their life have stronger dynamics in this tug of war than butterflies that only mate once. Um, you know, monogamy kind of diffuses uh, this kind of competition and should have consequences for, for these dynamics. And so, so we're, uh, and what's interesting about, um, about these butterflies is that they differ in the amount of uh, resources they have for their host plants too. So we can kind of separate what's the influence of the kind of nutritional restrictions I talked about earlier versus the, these competitive pressures that, that drive a bit of a wedge between the sexes in terms of their interests. And how do those influence the evolution of this of these interactions in the reproductive tract? So, so that's one of the things that we're hoping to do next. But, you know, it involves like, traveling to little relic populations here and there and getting enough butterflies and then sticking them in RNA preservative. And, you know, it, you know it, it's, um, I, I mentioned sabbatical earlier, but I've always thought about going to Stockholm to spend some time with Krister, who's, who's now retired, but just to go swing a butterfly net around Gotland and Sweden, various places in Sweden to, to do this project. So who knows? We'll see. It's a couple of years time before I get to take off on sabbatical. So, but that's one of the things that we're looking at. Uh, Nathan, wouldn't a uh, monogamous butterfly um, increase the pre-copulatory behavior or the contrast there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, th there's, this is an interesting synergy between our work on jumping spiders because um, ju the jumping spider that I showed you earlier at the very beginning of the presentation, those jumping spiders are largely monogamous and, and you'd kind of be shocked, you know, the guy, the man, the, 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 the man, the, the male jumping spider is, is um, really pulling out all stops. But we think that's because it's such a high stakes game for him because the female's only going to mate once, right? And that means that the male mating rate is really pretty reduced. And so, yeah, that is one possibility is that these post copulatory things diffuse a little bit, but then the high stakes is all pre copulatory. Um, so. So Nathan, today I was watching uh, a jumping spider, much like the one you showed, except minus the peacock tail. Yep. Those were fabulous videos, by the way. Such an animal. But I was watching one crawl up the side of this beer glass, kept trying to get my beer. I don't know if, if the little saltistas love the beer or not. I kept taking it off. But while I was doing that, past me flew, as have several times this week, uh, the native white here, the uh, Pyaris marginalis, the margined white uh -huh. in, the, in the Napi group. And uh, they are almost dimorphic uh, in the females in the springtime with some really quite white individuals, but some of them, John, wouldn't you agree, even yellower than the yellowest cabbage white. Oh, some absolutely, yeah. Them are like, like butter pats. I mean, they're wow. just very, very yellow. Lovely, lovely things. And you can see them when they fly by. One went by today that was as, as yellow as any coleus. And so I'm, I'm guessing from what you said that perhaps those have a stronger pull upon the males visually? Yeah, yeah, that would be my guess without, you know, that would be my, my kind of entering hypothesis there. Um, you know, one thing I've learned as a scientist is to, uh, <laughs> things don't, aren't always what you might imagine them to be. So you would, we'd really have to study it, you know. And, and the other thing is, as I'm sure you know, Art Shapiro's dedicated much of his career to studying 
these really incredible changes across seasonality and phenology in these things. And so how do male preferences and female preferences track that? You know, it's, 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 it's hard to know, but it, 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 the, the, the criteria may change for the, for the spring ephemerals or for that first generation out, which is oftentimes so different in appearance after overwintering right. than, than the summer uh, direct developing forms. Uh, we just don't know how things like diapause might influence the cognitive processes and decision making of the of the sexes. So fascinating stuff. I, you know, I did my postdoc with Jerome Casas at the University de Tour, and we were studying the European map butterfly, which is bright orange in the spring and black and white in the summer. Talk about an effect of overwintering, right? But many of these many of these pyrids are are really quite distinct in the spring and charmingly so. Um, and not always in the direction you might imagine. They're not always darker in the spring. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, the males are brighter white in the spring, which kind of goes against what you might think if they're trying to keep warm in the, in the cool spring days. But anyway, that's a bit of a wander to say that I'd love to know more about it. Um, it sounds like a fascinating puzzle. I also appreciate your use of uh, cognitive function. And you also referred to the mind of the, of the jumping spider. There was a time when that might have been thought anthropomorphic itself. But now that we have microcomputers getting down to the size of microns, perhaps not. Well, and keep in mind that the jumping spiders can plan routes to destinations that they can't see along the way. And they can, they can uh, you know, tell the difference between one, two, three, and four. So I think um, part of the Part of the reason why I'm comfortable with that type of language is that um, we're gradually eroding the specialness of our own minds, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which right. I think is a healthy and humbling thing for us to do. Right on. I watched the jumping spider crawling under the ceiling of my front room one day, and there was a larger spider coming in behind it on the ceiling, and I thought, "What's that jumping spider going to do? He just dropped off the ceiling and hit the carpet and took off." <laughs> well you know what's what's funny i i met i mentioned to paulette earlier that i had this wonderful interaction with the university of washington which i'm sure is right in the backyard of many of you folks um several years ago i was up late watching a hockey game and i discovered that um on twitter i'd gotten roped into a conversation uh, by a, a couple of faculty at the University of Washington Department of Astronomy who had had this invasion of jumping spiders and they'd gotten the facilities guys to come in and spray and it hadn't worked and here the jumping spiders were again and they were arachnophobic and so like any good scientist they started playing with them with with laser pointers and they had two kinds of laser pointers they had a red laser pointer and they had a green laser pointer and they found that the jumping spiders were much more reactive to the green laser pointer than the red laser pointer. Wow. So here I come, enter stage left, because a friend of mine ropes me and says, Nate probably can tell you why that is. And so, yeah, of course, you know, jumping spiders are more sensitive to green light than to red light. So of course they should do this. Then I start describing to these astronomers how jumping spider eyes are built, which is like Galilean telescopes, and they can see the world as well as an elephant and blah, blah, blah. And they're kind of like cheering on the, on, on the West Coast while I'm doing this in the middle of the night you know, in Pittsburgh at the time. So we had this wonderful exchange on Twitter of all places. And um, the next morning I wake up to interview requests from the Atlantic and from National Geographic because the thing has just gone bonkers online because I had begun, we're doing all these calculations about whether or not jumping spiders can see the moon and could they see the Andromeda galaxy? What could they see in the night sky if they looked up? So I'm like doing all these calculations about their vision and what they could or couldn't see. So this all blows up, it's hilarious. So I get invited to give a seminar on jumping spider vision to the astronomy department at the University of Washington. So wow. some years ago, in the before times, if you were, I flew out to Seattle to talk with the astronomy department about jumping spiders on their ceilings. It was such a delight. Uh, Seattle is such a great town and I had such a wonderful time. And I bet they never sprayed them again. No, 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 no. They're still, they, they still ping me anytime they see a jumping spider. <laughs> what a great story.
<laughs> yeah, it was a real. So book. Nathan, I was hoping I didn't quite catch the changes you described in the coloration of the cabbage whites after we started using synthetic fertilizers so much on their food crops. Yeah, um, well, I can elaborate on that. So um, in natural environments, individual butterflies will differ in their ability to be colorful um, based on their genetics, which I showed, but also based on whatever the choice was that their mother um, made when they laid an egg, right? So they may, she may have laid them on a kind of particularly poor plant or a dying plant or a plant that doesn't have a whole lot of nitrogen, and then they're stuck. They don't really spend a lot of their time moving around looking for better food. And so in natural populations, males and females differ a lot in what they had access to and how well they could make use of that. What we've done by dumping lots of nitrogen-based fertilizers into our farms and that runs off into waterways is we've flushed our natural areas with nitrogen. So now everybody can afford to be colorful in a way. So the result is that if you look at museum collections before World War II, not only is there greater variation in how colorful these animals are, there's greater variation in body size. And when you look at the relationship between how big a cabbage white is and how colorful it is, it's a much stronger relationship between size and colorfulness. If you look at that after World War II, um, and of course this is all with caveats about museum collections and selective capture, et cetera. But nevertheless, one of the, the, the important things is the variation between animals in color and in body size goes down, but also that relationship becomes much less strong. And we think that's simply because that we've just flooded the economy of these butterflies with the thing that was in most limiting supply to them before. So now everybody kind of affords to be colorful. So, so does that mean that uh, cabbage whites are, are also generally bigger than they were uh, pre-World War II? Or more consistently large, right? So I, uh, there, there's no evidence that they're evolving to be bigger animals in general, but mm -hmm. you just get uh, much more consistently kind of full-sized uh, uh, cabbage whites than, than before. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we all know some colonies of cabbage whites uh, on watercress. Yep. I don't even know if the watercress is native or not. I suspect not. But yeah. they'll often be in seeps yep. at the bottom of the rim rock, for example, in the Columbia Gorge or in the coolies. And the water in the seeps is all coming off the irrigated plateaus up above mm -hmm. on the agricultural plateaus. Oh man, it just occurs to me that watercress in those seeps must be so nitrogenously rich. Um, that'd be a really good place to look at that relationship because the cabbage whites are there by the billions. It's yeah, all, yeah. Listen, it's all being fed by the agricultural runoff. So I had the good fortune of um, of studying cabbage whites during my PhD in Sedona, Arizona. But again, on nasturtium officinale, so so watercress in in um, in the gorges there in this, the Sedona area, where there was less agricultural pressure, and so. Um, their food plant was perhaps less saturated with this agricultural runoff. But yeah, absolutely, many of the places that these animals are, and of course, when we're collecting them on organic farms, you know, they're using organic fertilizers, they're not using this synthetic stuff, but nevertheless, they, they, they have pretty good eating there. Mm, I bet. So. Yeah, it would be interesting to look at them because, you know, different habitats have different nitrogen cycles, you know, different amounts of nitrogen in them. But like, for instance, I spend a lot of time working in the field in relatively nitrogen poor vegetation, but we never see cabbage whites out there either. Uh, uh, they tend to be in towns, in agricultural areas, places where things are fertilized. So maybe that's part of how they decide where they're going to be really numerous, because I work on the South Sound prairies a lot. Uh -huh. Really nitrogen poor, which is part of the problem with the scotch broom invading it and dumping nitrogen into the soil by nitrogen fixation, but we never see cabbage whites out there. 
Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Well, um, Emily Snellroot at the University of Minnesota has looked at some of these agricultural and more rural sites for cabbage whites. And I think she should have some work coming out pretty soon about that contrast as well. She's also been looking at um, things like uh, road salt and how that affects the butterfly populations that use roadside blooms or use roadside plants. And again, you know, kind of limitations, but in that instance, things like sodium and other things that are important for, for brain development. But yeah, yeah. I, um, I don't know. I don't know if the cabbage whites are not there because they're selectively picking more nitrogen productive landscapes or, yeah. It'd be hard to say. I mean, there aren't really any crucifers out there anyway, but yeah. they're in all the rural residential areas that surround these prairies. So they're in people's gardens. Yeah, interesting. Maybe they've just gotten to be too pampered by human activities. <laughs> they've got no motivation to go <laughs> roughing it in the <laughs> in the areas that you're out in. Brings up something I would be remiss not to ask you while we got you, Nathan. Um, considering the nuptial gift in the spermatophore and the big expense that represents to the male. I think you said up to 14% of body weight sometimes. Yep, yep. Uh, and then considering that in respect to mud puddling, uh, it's been suggested and uh, I'm wondering what your views are on the male puddling activity, primarily a male activity when it comes to the mud puddles as opposed to the mineral, the mineral puddling as opposed to the organics that females partake in too, the carrion and the scat and so on. So do you suppose that the uh, mineral uh, rich mud puddling, the salt based stuff, does that have to do, would you say, with the replenishment of the, sperm the next spermatophores? Oh, well, it's such a tantalizing connection. The, the data is just not there to back it up yet. I mean, there's been work on by cyclists on Inanna and others mm -hmm. trying to find that connection. Um, I'm not really willing to let that possibility go, although many of the minerals that they're looking for are oftentimes important for their own neural functioning or their own upkeep. So it may be that males are actually being self-serving in that kind of puddling behavior, really in helping themselves to kind of be more competitive at finding females and perceiving them. But I would love to see a connection with the spermatophore. And I would suspect that at least in some instances that, that, that there is that connection that males are transferring some of those resources to females. But I, the, the evidence out there is just, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't support it yet. And so, I don't know, it's intriguing. I would love to know what the differential motivations of males and females are for that kind of specific of uh, uh, foraging strategies that you described, because there are they are different between the sexes, and the question really is why. Yeah, they really are, and I'm, I'm glad I asked. But uh, uh, I mean, the spermatophores are are uh, created sequentially de novo, right? They're not yep. like eggs that have a cell at the beginning, all when you're born, and uh, so that does that does put quite a, a demand on the condition, does it not? It does. And well, and you know, what's interesting, both males and females, when they run out of uh, liquid assets, as it were, they begin to break down their bodies. So females, as they get towards the end of their life, begin to break down their flight muscle to liberate proteins to make more eggs. And males do the same thing. So they begin sacrificing less essential parts of their bodies to to invest in reproduction seems like a <laughs> kind of a, a a strategy of last resort but yes, nevertheless exactly. it's, you know exactly. it is what they do they do seem to have the capacity to engage in apoptosis of flight tissues etc when they're really out of gas so um yeah extraordinary very cool stuff my kids should not expect that from me. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> we pop access from us. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I know it's getting late, so we should let you off the hook here, Nathan. But this has been such a wonderful talk. We so much appreciate your joining us, and especially since you're coming to us from the 
uh, joining us from the East Coast. So we're very grateful to you for staying up so late and sharing so much wonderful information with us. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was, you know, when your request came in, I was delighted to, to, to receive it. And um, it's good to see some familiar faces and names in the, in the crowd too. So one of these days, maybe I'll make it back out to Seattle and I'll see a few of you in person. Oh, you'll have lots of friends out here then. Yeah. <laughs> please, please come, yeah. We'll all go see the jumping spiders in the astronomy department. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll enjoy those spring ephemerals that I'm sure are out, out now. And um, and yeah, feel free to follow up with any questions that I didn't have a chance to answer. I'd love to stay in touch. So Okay, we'll do that. Okay, thank you so much, Nathan. Yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you Nathan. All right. Thanks. Thank have you. a good night. And you. Thank you. I saw a morning cloak several blues, several whites today, and a zelican swallowtail and a swallowtail in my yard yesterday. So it's not been a bad week. Yay. Hey, I've got a little news. Um, I got a Lucia. You finally did? I did, female. And uh, I've measured its vision <laughs> yeah. on eight different parts of its eye. <laughs> Wow. So um, that was, was really good. Family? It was hard one. Woodhouse Lake area. Is it different from Echo in the eyes? Um, or Nigressus? I, I don't know. I <clears throat> That kind of detailed study I've only done on uh, Celestrina Echo. That's what I'm saying. Oh. Yeah, but I've got to get a male Lucia. Oh, okay. And a female echo. <laughs> Where did you find it, Gary? Uh, Woodhouse Lake area. I got the uh, I got the GPS coordinates. Oh, okay. of where, Can you give us just a general idea where that is? Yeah, it's near Ellensburg, uh, Canyon Road, just off Canyon Road. There's a Woodhouse Loop that's got kind of smushy, lakey things around. It's sort of in there. Fabulous. Yeah, well I, I think uh, there was a, a colony uh, reported on uh, Ringer, Ringer the Road, so I don't, it sounds like it's nearby. It, yeah, um, this is about a mile up the road, maybe, sometime mile and a half from Ringer Loop Woodhouse. I think Caitlin, I think, mentioned uh, finding, she had a couple of, uh, at least a map of some spots where she found them. And mine's a little different, but it's sort of in that same general smooshy area. This is such a great surprise this year that there's quite a bit of Lucia habitat there in Kittitas County. There were a couple of old records, but now it's seeming that it may be more extensive there even than down around Kawichi. Yeah, and, and this one I got, I mean, it's got really big splotches on it. I mean, it's there's no doubt this is Lucia. Well, it's got some white scales on top too, though, right? Um, I didn't. I don't think I looked at that. I was so excited about getting it back home. I, I had pictures of the underneath, and and uh, so yeah, I don't know. I've also uh, put it into RNA later, and I'm going to send it to. My colleague in Sweden, she's going to do total genome. We're working on Celestrina and Colophores as groups. Very interested in what the relationship between their vision and their wings, particularly in those Colophores. I'm yeah. really interested in that, you know, the greenies and the mahogany ones. And so I'll keep us informed. Will do. Okay, well, thanks very much, everybody. And I think that um, concludes our presentations for the season. Hopefully, we'll see you all out in the field here at some point in time. Thank you. It's this good has been really great. I, I agree with Bob. <clears throat> it's great. really been great, great, great presentations. It was. He did a very nice job. Yeah, I agree. Okay, well, we'll thanks see you all. Thanks for organizing it. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Okay. Glad you had a good, good time on Maui, Carolyn. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.